so that's uh, that's me in a nutshell. Um, what I thought I'd do is start by giving a bit of history of the shipbuilding industry to provide a bit of context to the situation today, uh, especially for those who are not familiar with uh, with the maritime industry. Um, then I'll talk about what's going on in the industry today uh, and developments in the sort of wider maritime and port sector that might hold prospects for dispute boards in the future. Uh, please feel free to chip in with any comments or questions via the chat function as we go along. Uh, I think we've got some time allocated at the end for questions and discussion. And I know Martin, uh, who's behind the scenes um, on the tech side, can also patch people in from the audience if needs be. So feel free to contribute. Um, so a brief history of shipbuilding. Uh, the UK is a good place to start. Uh, the UK has a, has a rich history of shipbuilding dating as far back as the Roman conquest uh, and until recently as the 1960s really. Um, shipbuilders are known as shipwrights uh, and references to, sh uh, to city shipwrights date as far back as the 13th century. Uh, until, the, until the 19th century shipbuilding was centered around London and the Thames initially and, and there was also important royal dockyards in, in Harwich, Sheerness, Plymouth and, and Portsmouth. Uh, in the 1570s, the famous Golden Hind, uh, in which Sir Francis Drake, uh, also known as the Queen's Pirate, uh, circumnavigated the globe between 1577 and 1580. Uh, that ship was built in Plymouth, Devon, uh, and the replica that can be found in London today was built at Appledore Shipyard, also in Devon, in 1973. Uh, you had Lord Nelson's 100-gun uh, HMS Victory, which was built in 1759 to 1765 at Chatham Dockyard on, on the River Medway in Kent, They're using 5,000 oak trees in the process, apparently. Uh, she was reconstructed in 1798 and fought in the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805. Uh, and in 1922, that ship was moved to a, to a dry dock at Portsmouth and preserved as a museum ship, uh, where you can still view her today. Uh, she's been the flagship of the first Sea Lord since October 2012. Uh, and is the world's oldest naval ship still in commission with 242 years of service as of this year. Uh, it was in the 18th century really that uh, some of the maritime industry's best known institutions were founded. Uh, Lloyd's Register was founded in 1760 uh, in a coffee house in, uh, in Lombard Street in London to give merchants and underwriters uh, recorded information on the, on the quality of their vessels. The register book listed um, vessels rated or classed after the condition of their hulls and equipment had been surveyed. Uh, the subscriptions generated by the register book paid for the surveyors to carry out their work. Uh, and this was the beginning of, of classification societies um, uh, yeah, as they're known today. And, and Lloyd's remain a, a leading uh, classification society still today. Uh, around the same time as Lloyd's register was founded, so mid 1700s, uh, what is known uh, or now known as the Baltic Exchange uh, was being formed in another coffee house uh, nearby, uh, the Virginia and Baltic Coffee House on, the, on Threadneedle Street in London. Uh, English coffee houses in the 17th and 18th centuries were important places for merchants and sea captains to exchange news and uh, negotiate contracts with carriage. Uh, whilst the influence of the Baltic Exchange as a forum for circulating cargoes and ship positions has waned um, following the advent of telephone and, and modern communication, uh, it still remains an integral part of the fabric of the global maritime community, amongst other things, producing an index of trade routes uh, and market rates on the back of which uh, freight derivatives uh, are traded. Uh, getting back to the, uh, to the ships, uh, British tea clippers uh, were a big feature of the 19th century merchant fleet. Uh, designed for speed, they were narrow uh, and had a large total sail area and were built in response to a growing demand for faster delivery from tea uh, from China. Uh, the Cutty Sark is a, is a, is a fine example of those, uh, those ships. Um, the Industrial Revolution caused a boom in shipping demand. Uh, raw materials were needed for import, manufactured goods were exported, and there was a huge need for coal to, to power all of these things. Um, ship sizes increased in the 19th century due to the change from wood to iron and, and then to steel. Uh, and in the 1870s, more uh, efficient engines were introduced so that sailing ships like the tea clippers uh, began to be phased out. Um, yards, it's around that time too that yards in the northeast and, and in Scotland became dominant and, and those in uh, East Anglia started to, uh, to decline. So by the 19th century, Britain had built the, the largest merchant fleet in the world. Half of the ocean going tonnage was under the British red ensign flag uh, and British yards produced the majority of the world's shipping 
uh, at the end of the century, you know, mostly uh, steam trampers. The 20th century and the two world wars saw large chunks of the merchant shipping fleet sunk, uh, whilst the fleets of other neutral countries expanded. Uh, but Britain's fleet was replenished during a shipping boom in the 1950s and, and excluding tankers and the US war reserve, uh, Britain still had the world's largest merchant fleet in, uh, in 1957. The, uh, the boom continued into the 60s uh, with ships getting bigger and bigger. Containerization changed the world by sort of revolutionizing the, uh, the flow of goods, uh, but shipping and shipbuilding influence by that time was shifting unmistakably toward the east. Uh, and the and UK shipbuilding went in steep decline. Uh, the oil industry of the early of the 19 uh, early 1970s uh, led to a deep depression in shipping, and, and the global fleet size remained pretty unchanged uh, until 1990, uh, by which time there was very little shipbuilding left in the UK. So, so the UK went from being the preeminent global shipbuilder until as recently as the 1950s to having less than a one percent market share by the end of the century, losing out to shipbuilders in, in Asia mostly uh, with, who, who had uh, operated with you know, far lower labor costs and, and access to, to cheaper materials. Um, all that being said, um, the UK is still the fifth largest trading nation, exporting 26% of its gross domestic product, with 95% of that uh, trade going by sea. So, so ships and shipping remain an integral part of the, of the UK economy. Uh, in fact, according to Maritime UK, uh, the maritime sector contributes £46 billion in gross value add to the UK economy and supports over a million jobs. Um, and that's without much shipbuilding. Uh, what the UK have managed to keep hold of throughout the decline in shipbuilding is, is a world leading position in maritime services such as insurance, law, shipbroking, education and training, as well as equipment and supplies, and, and until recently, fairly recently, ship finance as well. Uh, the London Maritime Arbitrators Association uh, handle over 80% of maritime disputes globally, uh, consisting of just under 3,000 appointments in 2019. And London law firms and their overseas offices uh, are world leaders in, in maritime related disputes. Uh, by far the world's largest shipbroker, Clarkson's, is a London based firm, um, as are many of its major competitors. Uh, and all these firms, like Lloyd's Register, are global businesses today. So that provides a bit of historical context. Um, why is shipbuilding interesting to us now in the UK? And, and what are the prospects for dispute boards? You might think that's a very good question, given the historical context. But, but actually, there are some potentially very interesting developments afoot in, in UK shipbuilding. Um, first and foremost, the Navy needs more ships. Uh, two large state-of-the-art um, aircraft carriers have just been built uh, or are being built in, uh, in Rosyth Dockyard in, uh, in Scotland, uh, the largest warships ever built for the Royal Navy, uh, and plans are afoot to replace aging support vessels as well. Um, a fleet of five Type 31 general purpose frigates are due to be built by a consortium of companies led by Babcock International, uh, the first of which is due to be built at Rosyth as well, uh, but other shipyards are expected to be, to be used in the construction of this, uh, this series of ships. Uh, the first of which is estimated to be in the water in 2023 and, and in service sometime between 2025 and 2027. This order alone is estimated to cost just under £2 billion uh, and support over 2,500 jobs in the UK, uh, across the UK. Uh, the government have also committed to buying eight uh, Type 26 global combat ships, uh, a signed contract uh, for the first three, um, sorry, a contract was signed for the first three in, in July 2017 uh, to be built by BAE Systems on, on the Clyde in Scotland. Uh, a contract for the second batch of five is expected to be awarded this or, or next year. Uh, and the government intends to buy two, possibly three fleet solid support vessels uh, for the Royal Fleet Auxiliary uh, used to supply the ships and forces with, uh, with sea, uh, uh, sorry, at sea with uh, food, ammunition uh, and spares. The competition for that uh, is an international one, but the government is under pressure to prioritize uh, UK shipbuilders and, and UK content uh, generally. There's also a drive by the UK defense industry and, and by government to target exports of naval ships, systems and equipment. So the theory is that these naval orders should provide a platform on which UK shipbuilders can tool up and, and compete for international business. 
Uh, and the scope for UK shipbuilders isn't restricted to naval orders, rather the naval orders can potentially provide a springboard for which UK shipbuilders can, can resurrect themselves and, and participate in other sectors as well. So uh, aside from the naval aspect of UK shipbuilding, the UK has the largest and most developed offshore wind industry in the world. Uh, the UK offshore wind industry is about 20 years old, it's young, uh, and the UK market was the biggest offshore wind market globally for the past nine years uh, and is set to grow considerably further. In 2019, the equivalent of 10% of the UK's total electricity demand was produced by offshore wind, uh, enough to power 30% of household electricity consumption. And that was, that was in 2019. There was 10 gigawatts of operating capacity in, in 2019, with more in the pipeline. And by 2030, the government wants to have 30 gigawatts of capacity, which equates to over 40 billion pounds worth of infrastructure spending in the next decade and one to two gigawatts um, uh, increased capacity per year to 2030. Now, just to put those, th those numbers in perspective a little bit, a, a one gigawatt wind farm would consist of 100 10 megawatt turbines, each standing over 200 meters tall. The installed cost of one 10 megawatt turbine is about 10 million pounds. Uh, and that is a fraction of the cost of developing, building and maintaining the wind farm and all its, uh, and all its infrastructure and its connection to the national grid. So the investment is enormous uh, and, it's, and it's long term. These wind farms are located uh, in Scotland, um, East Anglia, Wales uh, and Northern England, um, which are all areas you know, that are in dire need of investment and, and jobs. In 2019, the UK had 45% market share of European offshore wind generating capacity, followed by Germany with 34%. Uh, and globally, some estimates envisage 17% um, annual growth from 22 megawatts to 154 megawatts in total installed capacity by 2030. So there's a lot going on in the offshore wind sector, undoubtedly. Why is this interesting? Um, well, many, if not all, UK shipyards are already fabricating wind turbines and or being used in the installation process and, and so are involved already in the offshore wind sector. Um, and the government wants to push the UK content of future wind farms up from, from 50 to 60%. So industry is being actively encouraged to expand the UK supply chain to cater to that, uh, and that means skills and labor, uh, equipment and, and technology, uh, much of which has been import imported from European manufacturers to date. Linked to that, uh, this new industry and, and market uh, is increasingly demanding new purpose-built tonnage to install, service uh, and maintain these offshore wind farms with the latest cutting edge technology. Uh, arguably, UK shipbuilders are well placed to participate in that. Uh, for example, um, it was recently announced that a company called Scorpio Bulkers uh, had placed an order at a Korean shipyard for a state-of-the-art wind turbine installation vessel uh, at a cost of around $290 million. They also have options for three additional units, which they have said they do anticipate declaring. Interestingly, too, they have no charter coverage for these ships currently, although it is expected that they, that they will get it imminently. Um, it's also recognised that this order is a drop in the ocean in terms of the tonnage that will be required to install all the future wind turbines. Now, now I'm not suggesting that UK shipyards could have built those ships today, uh, and it might be that UK shipbuilders should focus at least initially on, on smaller service operation and maintenance vessels initially, uh, and these sorts of ships run at a cost of closer to $50 million as opposed to $300 million, um, and they're being built currently in, in other European shipyards already. Um, but, but what this does demonstrate is that there's a new market forming uh, and actually one of the first movers uh, amongst ship owners to that market is a US publicly listed bulker company. You can imagine uh, how, uh, how confused their investors were. Um, and then there's a the matter of decarbonisation. Uh, I mean, this is all happening at a time when the global shipping industry is having to grapple with decarbonisation uh, and the clock is ticking for the industry to come up with new propulsion systems and, and ways to reduce and eventually eliminate its carbon footprint uh, by inventing clean, green vessels of the future. Uh, a lot of investment is, is needed in research and development and, and technical innovations around engines and, and propulsion systems which is taking place at different speeds in, in different shipping sectors uh, all around the world. So there's a lot going on. 
there's a lot of change afoot in the industry generally and certainly also in the UK. Um, in 2016, Sir John Parker um, published an independent review of the state of the UK shipbuilding industry and the contribution that it could make to the British economy. And his recommendations were almost entirely accepted by government and included in a new uh, national shipbuilding strategy in 2017. Um, that strategy completely overhauls the way the MOD procures surface ships with BAE systems no longer being the, the default main supplier, rather ship design and build has been opened up to competition. The strategy is intended to sort of energize the UK shipbuilding industry and retain and increase naval engineering skills and sustain jobs and, and it appears to be having some success. Um, Harland and Wolf in Belfast were bought out uh, of administration by London listed Infrastrata in 2019 uh, uh, and in joint venture with um, Navantia of Spain. Uh, they're vying for orders uh, and recently also acquired the historic Appledore shipyard in Devon. Uh, you may have seen Boris Johnson and the CEO John Wood on the news regarding that just a couple of weeks ago. So the government is engaged uh, in and committed to the idea of UK shipbuilding contributing to a more general increase in manufacturing capability in the UK and there appears to be a high level of interaction between government and the maritime industry in general. That and the real possibility of new orders being placed has, uh, has spurred a flurry of activity like the Harland and Wolf uh, example I, uh, I provided. Um, going back to the, to the national shipbuilding um, strategy, what's interesting for advocates of dispute boards is that it incorporates a clear governance structure, including a requirement for project delivery boards, as I, as I mentioned earlier, um, that appear to me to be, on the face of it, what we associate with dispute boards. Um, uh, with the stated aim of injecting pace into the procurement process and emphasizing the benefit of collaborative rather than combative uh, approach to the contract. Uh, which are all approaches I think the DRBF fully supports. Um, I'm not aware if any such boards are actually in existence yet, um, but it's certainly encouraging that they are an embedded part of the national shipbuilding strategy. Uh, I'm not sure that private shipyards and buyers of commercial vessels will pay much attention to the national shipbuilding strategy. I don't think there's any requirement for them to do so as such. Um, but as the initial shipbuilding activity is likely to be on the back of government naval contracts, it's interesting and positive that they're set to feature there and perhaps might set a precedent for wider adoption by shipbuilders in, in commercial contracts as well. So other than naval orders, where else might dispute boards fit in? Well, certainly uh, I think uh, uh, there's an opportunity uh, for within the, the wind farm, offshore wind farm sector. Um, it's encouraging that the government have chosen to adopt delivery boards in, in naval ship procurement. Uh, going forward, um, the government via the Crown Estate are responsible for leasing uh, the seabed for the development of wind farms. Um, I don't know uh, whether or to what extent project delivery boards are a feature of those leases and, and the plethora of contracts underneath them, but it would be fantastic obviously if, if project delivery boards were to be adopted there as well. Um, wind farms are a large scale, high value projects involving collaboration between a vast array of suppliers, contractors, uh, and stakeholders over an extended period of time you know, spanning the life cycle of a wind farm. So um, I think it's fair to say that shipbuilding, contra uh, yeah, uh, shipbuilding contracts for standard commercial vessels built at shipyards in Asia, as they have invariably been done for the last 20, 30 years, um, have, have rarely, if ever, featured a dispute board. Uh, neither I or fellow arbitrators that I've spoken to have come across them before. Uh, brokers have, I suppose, filled part of the role of a dispute board by being a third party facil facilitator and sounding board, but usually the broker's role tends to diminish you know, when the contract is signed and, uh, and construction actually starts. Um, a lot of shipbuilding construction in the past 20 years has been for relatively standard designs with tried and tested construction procedures and a lot of repeat business as well, um, which may, may be another factor that dispute boards haven't featured. Um, also trust between builder and buyer is very important for Asian shipyards uh, and I can easily imagine that introducing a third party sort of moderator into a, a contract is something that they would be uncomfortable with culturally. Um, sometimes uh, shipbuilding contracts uh, will include a provision for technical, for technical disputes to be referred to and decided by the classification society or, or a designated technical expert. Um, but class societies will usually restrict themselves to making decisions if the issue concerns um, you know, interpretation of class rules 
Um, and the dispute resolution clause usually requires that consents uh, of both parties um, uh, be received to, to decide that the dispute is a technical one. Uh, uh, often they can't agree to that, in which case the dispute resolution clause is triggered uh, you know, and parties move either to mediation or, or arbitration or recourse via the courts. Um, so, so they've not featured today in Asian shipbuilding generally over the past couple of decades at least. Um, I think the opportunity for dispute boards lies more in orders involving new cutting edge technology, sophisticated designs, such as those for, for the offshore wind sector. Uh, and in contracts that incorporate new technology and long-term collaborations generally, um, the, you know, the service and maintenance of offshore wind farms um, be, being one such example, uh, if, of course, the right people can be, uh, can be persuaded of the merits. So I will end there and uh, open up the floor or microphone uh, for any comments or questions uh, and would certainly be happy to hear thoughts and, and ideas on, on other areas in the maritime sector uh, that people think that uh, dispute boards might have a role to play. So back to you, uh, Michael. Okay, thank you very much, Ben, for that. Um, something of a tour de force, actually. Um, <laughs> I had actually, being a bit of an armchair warrior, I had read the National Shipbuilding Strategy when it came out, and actually I'd failed to spot project delivery boards, so I must go back and have a look at that. Uh, and we have been tr trying to talk to the Ministry of Defence about uh, to dispute boards, particularly in the context of armoured vehicles. Um, so I must dig that out because I think that's quite an important point. Now, um, in terms of uh, questions, um, let's, um, let's just do, uh, deal with the poll questions first. So the first question was uh, whether people had encountered DAABs in non-construction settings, and 90% of people said no. And uh, the answer to the second poll question about encountering DAABs in uh, shipbuilding, 90% no. So we, at least on the second one about shipbuilding, two people said yes. Now, we don't know who they are, but if you were to identify yourself, it'd be quite interesting to hear from you. So um, perhaps Martin can keep a lookout for um, people who might have mm -hmm. said yes if you identify yourself. And then Martin can turn you into a panelist and you can speak up. So, um, Martin, uh, is anybody showing themselves? Not as yet. Not as yet. Okay. If you'd like to use the chat facility, uh, if you wish to speak, I can adjust accordingly. Okay. Well, let's, um, let, just while we're waiting on that one, uh, Dave Owen, um, who um, helps well, I, I, he really runs, and I started at the Mediator's New Breakfast Club. He's got a point here. He says, I heard on the wireless, that's a very old-fashioned word, isn't it? <laughs> Probably on the home service, last night, that California produces so much electricity via PV insulation, so that's, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. solar power, that it pays, not just gives for free, surrounding states to take its excess load so as not to overload its electricity system at peak production. Uh, thoughts, please. I mean, Ben, you were talking about decarbonisation in the shipbuilding industry. I wondered whether you had any thoughts about that. It's a bit like, you know, at one point the oil price not that long ago went negative, didn't it? Yeah, well, I mean, I think um, to, to address the California point, uh, I mean, they have a hell of a lot more sunshine than, than we have uh, here in uh, in Blighty, so uh, and I'm not sure what the what the situation with offshore you know, and, and and wind is generally uh, in California. Certainly, the UK has, is recognised as having fantastic conditions for for wind, and and we all know we don't get a huge amount of um, of sunshine. So I think certainly in terms of the energy mix, offshore wind for the UK has been identified and proven to be far more uh, efficient and cost effective for us in the UK given our conditions than um, than solar um, and it sounds like perhaps that's you know the situation is, is the reversed in California certainly of the, the wind farm uh, developments taking place that I'm aware of in in the U, in the US or that it kind of in the pipeline in the US are all off of Massachusetts and, and the northeast coast of the US. Um, because I think, I assume because of the favourable wind conditions there. But certainly offshore wind has overtaken onshore wind in terms of um, uh, economics uh, and, and viability generally. Okay. Um, 
I think Jim Daniels has said he has experience of DAB in shipyards, but only with oil rigs. Martin, is it possible for uh, you to um, connect with Jim and see if he can uh, yes, actually talk to us? Yes, stand by. Thank you. Jim, you should be able to join as a panelist in a moment to be able to speak. There he is, yes. Hello, Jim. He's muted. Okay. Let's try and do it. Unmute. Start video. Okay. Done all that. There we go. Hello, are. Jim. That's How are you? Hello. Very, Thank very you. good. Well, you're very welcome. Um, you, you said that you'd encountered DBs in the uh, oil rig sector. Yes, yes. And uh, I've just written uh, an article, and I don't know for which magazine it's going, but they say they accepted it, so it should be published very soon. I can't about... see him. I don't know if others can. Oh, yeah, no, sorry. No. no, I can see him. Yeah. Yes, but can you hear me talking? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, fine. Sorry about that. But I've just written an article. I, I say I can't say the publication, but it's due out sometime in the next three, four weeks, uh, about dispute boards in shipbuilding. But one particular event, I suppose, that I, I think is worthy of the use of dispute boards is during the visit to the yard, I found that a significant part of the contract had not been uh, performed, the shipyard had somehow neglected or forgotten to install a, an electrical system uh, in the hull of the vessel, the drilling rig. And this could have been a real problem. If the client suddenly found out that that had been missed, then there would be a lot of difficult work in, uh, in a position that should have been dealt with very early on. And to get back into the double bottoms of such of a, of a drilling rig is not easy work. So it would have put the contract into a real delay. I asked the shipyard about this and said, uh, this hasn't been done. And they said, yes, and we hope you don't say anything about it, which I didn't, <laughs> and, I, and I didn't. And fortunately, the client didn't pick up on it. So the shipyard got away with it. And I emphasize this point because the dispute board is not there to run the contract. The shipyard is doing the work and of course the client's there to do the inspection and you're there to sort of guide them to prevent disputes. And that's why I raised it with the shipyard that they were aware that this was an omission and uh, they were aware, but just keep shush. And I think that is the way you can keep the job going as it were. Now, if it came to a head, then I'm afraid I would have had to have sided with the client and said, yes, it is in the contract and you must do it. And so the fact that it's difficult now, you should have done it earlier. But uh, there are peculiarities like that that arise, but I always emphasize that you're not there to run the contract. You're there to stop them from blocking, from stopping the contract. Yeah. But well, presumably, Jim, you were acting as consultant to the shipyard on that job, were you? No, it was a, a, a job for, if you like, well, as a dispute board. So you, so you were the DB? I was the DB. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there were John, several John, other things that I did assist with, but it's not worth going into. Okay. John, it might be worth you were making an observation about that because that uh, when I did a D, uh, DRBF two-day course the, uh, uh, a month or so ago um, by two distinguished American gentlemen, they were very much emphasizing exactly what Jim says. You're not there to run the contract. I'd be interested to hear, John, what you've had been on lots of dispute boards. And if you encountered that situation as the DB, what would you do? Well, it's, it's absolutely right. You're not there to run the project. You're there to help people, other people who are appointed to do that, to run it. Uh, if you see that something's wrong, and that covers just about anything you can think of, well, why not just put it to them as a question? What, what are you doing about this? Or am I mistaken, but has this happened or has it not happened? And get people thinking. Uh, you're not there to push them about or tell them what to do. You can't issue instructions. You can't tell them how to build things. 
uh, you're there to to help them and i think they also want to see value for money they want to see you contribute and i think the latest statistic we had about value for money was that uh, certainly within region two the cost of a dispute board was something like 0.05 of 1% of the outturn value of the project. So in other words, we try to emphasize value, not cost. Yeah, okay. Uh, thanks. thanks for that. Uh, that's for that, Jim. Uh, somebody's asked, in fact, were, were you effectively meeting privately with the, con with the, with the shipyard when you had that conversation? Uh, yes, I responded. Yes. Yes, yeah, so that's right. Yeah, I see. Okay. Well, that's that's an in interesting uh, one. Um, you, you say you're not there to to sort of do the job for them, but the, I I had an example, and the shipyard had no idea how to build a drilling rig floor, how to pipe it, and where the machinery went, and so on and so forth. They had no drilling expertise at all. And the contractor, the, the client, who was obviously a drilling company, uh, just dug their heels in and refused to do anything about it. They didn't sort of say, well, this is what we'd like to have. They said, it's in the contract. You are to design that. And then you give us the drawings and we approve or disapprove yeah. these. And, and it's just a, an awful situation. So I went into the client's office and had a drawing uh, of the rig floor and I had little cut out uh, more or less to scale pictures of the equipment that goes on the rig floor cut out and I sort of stuck these all over the rig floor plan and said right now is this the right position to work these things with this suit you oh no no we want that one moved over here and this sort of stuff and it I made in about two hours a little montage or whatever you call it where you've got these stuck on pieces of paper and then i went back to the shipyard office drawing office and said there you are that's what you now draw and then it flowed from there on and that situation does not arise often but when it does the intransigence of the client can really mess things up yeah okay jim well thank you martin we can maybe take jim off the panel now um is anybody else uh, in? Bye bye, Jim. Thank you for that. Uh, ben, do you have any observations on uh, what Jim's just been talking about? I think the whole business of private meetings with, um, you know, with uh, with parties is uh, is 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 quite a tricky one. I mean, as as mediators, we do it all the time. But of course, we're that's what the mediation agreement allows us to do, and that's what, if you like, the practice of mediation allows us to do. I, uh, I have to admit I'm, I'm at a significant disadvantage because I couldn't hear a word he said. For some reason, I wasn't connected to him. Oh, okay. so, uh, so I didn't get to, to enjoy his words of wisdom. But, but, but I guess uh, certainly uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, that would be determined by the terms of the dispute board and, and, and their terms of engagement, I assume. Um, certainly, as you said, mediators uh, ply their trade by having uh, sort of shuttle diplomacy, private meetings between both, both parties, and bringing them together jointly when, um, uh, when, yeah. you know, when that's um, you know, sort of deemed to be appropriate. So um, I, 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 I guess it's uh, it's determined by the terms of that engagement. But yeah, unfortunately, I couldn't hear him, so I uh, I can't really comment much further than that. I'm sorry to say. Okay, uh, John, any any further thoughts on that um, that topic? What about meeting parties? Well, you yeah. don't you don't meet one party on their own. Well, that would have been my view as well, actually. But um, I mean, it does happen that you bump into people in airport lounges and you find you're on the same plane. But I mean, everybody's been very, very good about it and said, hello, shook hands. How are you? And then you talk about hmm. sport or the weather or how was your journey? And that's it. Yeah. OK, John, that's uh, very good. Well, at least we've discovered that we have some, we had somebody on the call who had experience, although I suppose uh, Build, well, it was shipbuilding, I guess, an oil rig, wouldn't it be, uh, Ben? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, what what I've been hearing so far is that um, perhaps apart from the, the two areas uh, which might be interesting to explore mm -hmm. is one is defence, and I must take another look at the shipbuilding strategy and project delivery boards. 
Um, and the other one is, uh, is offshore energy of one sort or another, particularly in wind. And I think you mentioned, um, Ben, that one of these new vessels that's been commissioned has a lifting capacity of 12,000 tonnes, was it? Um, uh, yes, um, the, the, the Scorpio bulk hair is one I, um, uh, I, I don't recall, uh, actually. Yeah. Um, but the, I mean, the wind turbines themselves are over 200 meters tall and, uh, and expected to probably max out in terms of size at 250, 260 meters in height individually. So as they've got bigger, uh, the, the ships required to transport them, uh, you know, from, from their place of construction or, you know, to out to the wind farm and install has, have obviously increased as well. Um, uh, and it's, I mean, it's, a, it's economies of scale at the end of the day. Um, they, they are much more um, efficient wind turbines, but actually the logistics of installing these bigger wind turbines is slightly less because fewer can be carried on board one ship at a time. So the ships are having to make more journeys and, and carry fewer of these, uh, fewer of these turbines. Um, one of the uh, sort of issues uh, that's been discussed recently around this Scorpio bulk carriers order is, you know, is the fact that ship owners have been held back somewhat in the last um, several several years uh, in ordering in this sector because of the very quick um, uh, evolution of wind turbine size and the fact that the technology and, and everything around it is is evolving so quickly. So they didn't know, considering it takes you know, two to, to five years to, to build these ships, uh, there's a concern that by the time you've, that this ship actually delivers, it's, it's already obsolete or, or not you know, perfectly fit for purpose. Um, the, the, there seems to be sort of growing consensus that that's less of an issue now because uh, the wind turbines are sort of maxing out in size and, and expected to, to remain at around the size and the, and the capacity that they are now. So providing a bit more certainty um, uh, and comfort to, uh, to owners like, like Scorpio Bulk. And the 250 metres height, is that the height of the, the pillar or is it the total height of the pillar or whatever you call it? And well, it's the, actually, yeah, the, the, the it, it's, the, it's the height of the, um, from the sea level, it's the, it's the height of the entire structure. Um, but the, uh, and the wing span, uh, if you like, of the turbines themselves is, it, it is, a, is a similar size. Yeah, okay. And um, we don't have, I don't, if anybody wants to ask a question, perhaps they could um, indicate to Martin on chat. We've got uh, probably about another five minutes left. Uh, ben, is it worth just talking about the kind of disputes that arise in uh, shipbuilding uh, contracts? I mean, are you, uh, do you have any experience with that or can you yeah, tell us a bit uh, more about that? Well, yeah, I mean, absolutely. They're, I mean, they're extremely wide, wide ranging. Um, um, liquidated damages, uh, and, and I imagine uh, there's a lot of overlap with, with uh, onshore construction disputes as well. Uh, a lot of disputes centre around time, uh, whether time was at large, uh, and who is responsible for, um, for delays. Uh, there's been a lot of legal discussion around the prevention principle um, in the UK, and whether, when and whether time is at large, and, and, and who is responsible for, for lost time. Uh, and force majeure situations and, and what is a force majeure um, um, uh, and, and sort of delays associated with, um, with, with unspecified uh, events. So um, yeah, I, I think that's probably uh, encapsulates the majority of, uh, of shipbuilding disputes. Um, a, a while ago, uh, after the sort of financial crisis, a lot of shipbuilding contracts were frustrated and ships just didn't get built and there were orders for ships at shipyards that hadn't been built yet. Um, and there was a lot of frustration, uh, frustrated um, new building contracts um, around that, which caused a lot of work for, uh, for fellow arbitrators, uh, I'm sure. Um, that, that seems to have mostly passed. Um, and it's, it's uh, a lot around the prevention principle and, and force majeure situations and, and liquidated damages, I think. Okay. Um, does anybody have any other questions? Otherwise, I was just going to make one quick observation and then um, we might move to giving Ben uh, a vote of thanks. I can't see anybody else on chat at the moment. Yeah, um, w I was at the SAMA 10th um, anniversary conference. That's the Singapore Chamber of Maritime Arbitration, I think, in Singapore at the back end of last year. And 
one of the senior guys from the port of Singapore came on to talk about their expansion plans, which should go to, to go to something, I forget whether it's 40 or 60 million TEUs, 20 foot equivalent units, um, by 2040, so another 20 years on. But what he said was a lot of this is obviously it's going to be a massive amount of construction work, but there's going to be a lot of work with systems because they're going to be working with artificial intelligence, driverless trucks, driverless cranes, and so on. And if we look at what's gone wrong, we'll say with Crossrail and some other projects, particularly in defense, um, a lot of it is, is problems with systems integration. And uh, I perhaps see that as something which is going to be in, of increasing importance. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, John, did we have somebody who was going to give a vote of thanks? Or perhaps would you like to do it or I'll, be, I'll do it? I think you're stuck with me, actually. Jolly um, good. Well, that's perfect. You don't mind. <laughs> um, just before I say a few words about um, Ben's excellent um, talk, could I just say that the DRBF is not an appointing body. It's a training body. And believe me, the training is pretty good that it gives. And it's also a body to help promote dispute boards and if you do click on join now you can certainly give us here in the uk some help in that if you're not based in the uk you will almost certainly have a country rep in your country uh, who would be glad to have your help the membership fees vary uh, from category to category but they're pretty reasonable um, if you want to know just a little bit more about DBs, um, our experience by way of research in Region 2 is that fewer than 5% of DBs decisions are taken on to arbitration. And of all of those which are taken on to arbitration, the last percentage I heard was that only 1.75% of those are decisions which are overturned. If you want to know more and to look into the dispute avoidance provisions, go to fidic.org and you can um, buy one of their 2017 contracts which have the DB rules in. A little bit expensive, 40, 40 euros odd a shot. But if you go to the ICC's website, iccwbo.org, you can download their dispute board rules free and you will see in there that there are specific provisions for disputes avoidance. Ben, you've given us a quite remarkable um, survey of shipbuilding as it was. And as I remember it when I was young, I always remember watching the black and white television of when we used to run these huge ships down the ramps um, in the days when we actually had an industry. And what you said given, has given me a lot of optimism about the future that we can build ships for the civil and the defense sectors. And you also mentioned um, the wind farms. Well, heavens knows, you know, we've got enough wind and enough water around these. <laughs> we can't make something out of that, there's something wrong. Um, and Jim touched on the oil and gas industry. We really need to try to penetrate that industry. We do feel that we can do a lot of good. And I'd like to thank you on behalf of all of our members here and everybody else who's listened to you. We have another breakfast meeting in November. Please watch out for that. We have a lunch meeting on the 30th of September, which is important because that's when the identity of my successor will be revealed. And uh, it, all members, please do try and attend that. And then we'll keep you up to date now that we've got your emails about future events. Ben, you're gonna be a hard act to follow. Um, you've been um, brilliant in coming from a different industry. You know your stuff. And uh, thank you for telling everybody how much good DBs can do. It's been a very, very welcome start to the morning. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. OK, thank you, Ben. Martin, would you like to then perhaps terminate the meeting but leave the panellists on? Can we do that? Yes, of course. Okay, okay thank you.
Thank you very much for everybody for joining. Thank you. Bye-bye.